NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents Aeronautics and Space Report. These jets landing at a large metropolitan airport may one day do so a lot quieter because of this small creature, an owl. When we examined the wing of an owl, we found that there was a serrated or a, a fine comb of feathers on the leading edge which pointed forward into the flow. And this comb or serration of feathers was the thing that we copied out of metal to form a, a rake which we placed on the leading edge of a, a rotor blade. And by simply copying this serrated feather, we found that we could indeed reduce the noise of a small rotor model, even though at that time we didn't understand how, how it uh, worked. That started a series of research projects to uncover the aerodynamic and the acoustic effects of serrations on reducing noise. Paul Soderman is an engineer with the Army Air Mobility R&D Lab at NASA's Ames Research Center in California. If it turns out that the serration does reduce the noise of uh, fan noise of jet engines, it would mean that the approach noise of aircraft approaching airports would be reduced, and it would mean less of a whine that people would hear as, as aircraft approach airports. Helicopters present a different kind of noise problem, especially as the helicopter blade slaps the air. Sawtooth rotor blades appear to be a promising way of reducing this noise also. Many future tests will take place in this 30 by 20 foot soundproof room. Walls, ceiling, and floor are covered by foam wedges. And these wedges absorb the sound such that there are no reflected sound waves from the walls, and we can make acoustic measurements in the room without worrying about contamination from reflected noise. It's the same as going on into, into free space and, and measuring noise, but now we can do it in a laboratory condition. From the wings of owls may come the ability to make tomorrow's airport a quieter place. The threat of fire in space is one that has challenged researchers for many years. Nearly everything in their spacecraft and worn by men in space has been tested for its fire resistance. As a result, there now exist materials made for space use that may one day make your home a lot safer from fires. The Battelle Institute in Columbus, Ohio, recently completed a series of experiments to test out these space age materials. This room, furnished from a local department store, was set on fire using a crumpled newspaper. Here's what happened. To better illustrate the burning sequences, the film speed is about five times faster than it actually was. Within 50 seconds, heat became intolerable. After 82 seconds, there was so much smoke that a person standing in the back of the room could not see the doorway. Within eight minutes, the room had been reduced to charcoal. By contrast, a similar fire was set in an identical room. This time, furnishings, wall, floor, and ceiling coverings were constructed of materials developed by NASA for the Man in Space program. In this room, only the newspaper was destroyed, and the fire went out in 12 minutes. Fire retardant materials. If used effectively, the danger from residential fires may one day be radically decreased. Presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, presents Aeronautics and Space Report. There are
are nearly half a million bridges in this country, although infrequently they do occasionally collapse, causing injury and death. Such was the case on December 15, 1967, when the Silver Bridge in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, collapsed from a structural defect and fell into the Ohio River. 48 people lost their lives. Some surveillance techniques, such as is represented by Random Deck, could very well have foretold the structural failure before it happened. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with Random Deck. We want to be able to keep very close track or a lot closer track than has been possible in the past of the structural integrity of bridges. Horace Emerson is in the Office of Technology Utilization at NASA's Ames Research Center in California. The Random Deck technique is a means of uh, obtaining random vibrational inputs to a structure such as this bridge that I'm standing near and processing those signals through an analyzer to obtain a signature for the structure. Now that signature won't change with time unless something happens to, to the structure itself or the bridge. Tiny accelerometers that sense vibrations in NASA wind tunnels are used along with a computer for analysis. The joint study with the Federal Highway Administration is an attempt to find out if the technique is feasible for use on bridges all over the U.S. Horace Emerson describes how the tests are made. Well, we started out here with the portable equipment that we need in the back of a station wagon, and then uh, the engineers climb up the hill and affix the accelerometers to uh, studs that have been previously glued to the structural members of the bridge. Now, this has two advantages. One, you don't damage the bridge at all, and you can always go back to the same, the exact same location with your accelerometer. Then the uh, wire that will carry the signal from the accelerometer is attached to the accelerometer and carried back down the hill and plugged into the tape recording equipment. Dr. Robert Reed of Nielsen Engineering and Research is making the on-site measurements. Here we have a portable oscilloscope which actually shows the vibration that's occurring on the bridge. When a car comes over the bridge, uh, here comes a small car now, you'll see a burst of vibration. There the car is above us. When the tape recorder is brought back from the bridge, the data is played back through our analysis equipment, which we can see Henry on Cole, also of Nielsen Engineering, here. processes the bridge data through the random deck computer. The signature forms here, and each time you see it flash, it means that a car or truck is passing over the bridge. Now, as this signature forms, it will take a definite shape, and we can compare that when it's complete with a signature taken from a previous month. Now, when we overlap the signature from this month and the one from last month, we notice that there are no changes. However, if changes did occur, then we could, uh, would have to go back to the bridge and inspect it more thoroughly. It would look like this if there were a crack or other structural problems on the bridge. Today, bridges are visually inspected. In the future, these same bridges may be reliably and inexpensively monitored for structural defects long before damage occurs using techniques from aeronautics and space research. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.
Calypso, this is U2 Operations. Uh, how do you read, over? This is the Calypso, research ship of ocean explorer Captain Jacques Cousteau. Here, communicating via satellite from its position off the coast of Florida with NASA's research facility in Wallops Island, Virginia. The Calypso served as a floating laboratory in a recent joint effort with NASA. What uh, the, the purpose of, uh, of this expedition is to establish a correlation between ground measurements, if we can call ground measurements sea measurements, and uh, measurements from high altitude. Uh, the goal being that to establish instrumentation for, later on, for high altitude satellites, as well as for high altitude flying airplanes. Flying at 65,000 feet, high altitude U-2 aircraft like this one made regular flights over the Calypso's position as it sampled the water along the Florida coast. A prototype instrument called the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, designed to fly on a future Nimbus weather satellite, was checked out during the overflights, and its data carefully compared to samples taken by the Calypso, an effort to sense small differences in the content of the ocean. This is really uh, a, a period where experimentally we want to be able to calibrate the, inst the instruments that will be uh, equipping the satellites of the future by measuring the um, productivity through chlorophyll measurements and by measuring the pollution by various methods. Uh, oil content of the surface, etc. While altitude, high altitude flying aircraft are doing the same measurements from a distance by photography uh, and comparing the results, both results, we can calibrate the instruments of the high altitude aircraft as you calibrate any instruments and later on extrapolate the results to put even more elaborate instruments in satellites. We asked Captain Cousteau what role satellites might play in the future as far as oceanographic research is concerned. Uh, this, is a, this is a question that, that I'm extremely interested in. I believe strongly that uh, oceanographic vessels uh, are not uh, the proper tool to uh, study uh, in a modern way the oceans. And I can explain this. The ocean is extremely vast, and uh, it's a gigantic medium, covering two-thirds of the Earth, being uh, much deeper than the Everest is high, etc., etc., etc. Uh, the only way out is to um, instrument the oceans with thousands of instrumented anchored buoys, and to interrogate these buoys by satellite, and to have a constant, in a, in a central computer, a constant meteorological forecast of the underwater conditions. Uh, also, satellites will be in a position to measure surface pollution and to measure surface productivity. So, the monitoring of the ocean in the future will be done by high altitude aircraft and by satellites. I'm convinced of that. And the role of ships will be reduced to a minimum. Viewing our oceans from on high, an important step toward fast and accurate assessments of ocean ecology. has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.
We've come a long way in weather forecasting since the early balloon launching days, thanks mainly to weather satellites. Just 15 years ago this month, NASA launched the first Tyros weather satellite from Cape Canaveral. The views of Earth were pretty rudimentary compared to today's high-quality pictures, but they proved that routine global weather observation by satellite was possible. With each succeeding one, these weather sentinels have become more and more sophisticated. Here, the synchronous meteorological satellite. Two are already in orbit, with a third scheduled for launch this fall. Besides transmitting cloud cover pictures every 30 minutes, day and night, SMS can receive and send environmental information from thousands of manned and unmanned data collection platforms located at sea, in rivers, lakes, and on land. The synchronous meteorological satellite pictures are made into film loops daily at the World Weather Center near Washington, D.C. to show cloud movement over oceans and land masses. Meteorologists are hopeful that this kind of information will give them clues to the weather conditions that, for instance, cause tornadoes and other fast-moving weather systems. Weather satellites, over the past 15 years, they have returned more than two million pictures, provided advance warnings, and allowed no major storm anywhere on the globe to go undetected. These model airplanes have something in common with these real planes. They are all part of a NASA research program to learn more about vortices, tornado-like patterns of air that trail behind the wings of airplanes causing varying degrees of turbulence. Dave Scott, Acting Director of NASA's Flight Research Center in California explains. The vortices are dangerous because uh, these bundles of energy, as they follow behind the aircraft, uh, leaving a wake, uh, have the capability of turning over smaller aircraft uh, as they approach a landing. And uh, because of this, uh, we have a great deal of concern that uh, many accidents can be caused uh, by the vortices or these bundles of energies as they uh, attempt to turn over an aircraft. While all aircraft cause vortices, large heavy jets such as the 747 and DC-10 create the more serious problems. Air traffic density around major airports adds to the severity of the problem. Because of the many aircraft coming in for a landing and the need to sequence one plane behind the other, aircraft are routinely separated at safe distances to avoid the trailing vortex problem. However, this often results in increased fuel use and traffic delays. Smoke generators mounted on the wings of these planes by NASA researchers make it possible to see and investigate the whirling air patterns. The research has shown that by adjusting wing flaps at different angles and by making various design changes, the intensity of the vortices can be substantially reduced. This kind of aeronautical research today may very well result in even safer, more convenient flights in the future. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.
Today, sports enthusiasts around the world call it hang gliding. This is the man responsible for co-inventing the specially designed wing that is making hang gliding a rapidly growing sport. 63-year-old aeronautical engineer Francis M. Rogallo. Now retired from NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, he and his wife Gertrude, who co-invented the wing, live in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Rogallo enjoys flying a couple of times a week from what's been called the highest sand dune on the East Coast, Jockey Ridge. Turn to the left and come down, pull up, and land. And what's it like to hang glide? With a hang glider, as with other aircraft, uh, you have a freedom of uh, up and down direction as well as the others. And uh, just getting your feet off the ground and being lifted by, by the air it is a new experience. For Rogallo, the renewed interest as represented by hang gliding takes on particular significance. The big kites represent more than two decades of research, much of it on his own time. In 1963, he and his wife Gertrude received from NASA one of the highest cash awards ever given for an invention. The invention was uh, not an accident of, uh, at all. It was a, a purposeful search for a kind of wing that would be less expensive, more rugged, uh, more practical than the conventional kind of wing. And uh, we studied uh, uh, everything along that line that there had already been, like uh, boat sails, windmills, parachutes, and, and uh, airplane wings before coming up with this design. Experimenting with small gliders and kites, a good performing, completely flexible wing finally evolved in 1948. Ten years later, NASA was searching for devices that could be used to bring astronauts and their spacecraft to a safe landing on Earth. Early versions had many names, paraglider, para-wing, gliding parachute, and flexible wings. The basic design seen in all these can be seen in most hang gliders flying today. Intensive testing ranged all the way from small wind tunnel models to full-scale flight tests, complete with man and spacecraft attached. While the Rogallo wing, as it is known by many, has had limited applications, Rogallo himself is optimistic that the new interest generated by some 20,000 flyers worldwide will produce other uses in the future.
NASA Aeronautics and Space Report. Although the safety record of light aircraft continues to improve, there still were 700 crashes in the U.S. last year, resulting in more than 1,300 fatalities. Up till now, there has been no reliable method of predicting the behavior of general aviation planes when they do crash. In a joint project with the FAA, NASA is beginning a light aircraft crash safety program at the Langley Research Center in Virginia. This is one of 20 flood damaged planes that will be tested. The actual facility was originally used by Apollo astronauts to practice landing on the moon. The 240 foot high by 400 foot long lunar landing practice area is now laced with cables which are attached to the highly instrumented aircraft before it comes crashing to the ground. Dummies riding in the passenger seats are instrumented to measure G-forces. Engineers hope to learn what happens to an airframe structure when it impacts and to develop an analytical design tool that can be turned over to the designers and builders of general aviation planes. For this first checkout test, the plane is complete except for tail section and engines. Comparable weights take the place of missing parts and the fuel tanks are filled with water for weight and balance. This first crash was made at an impact speed of 30 miles per hour. Future drops will be at speeds up to 60 miles per hour. Five, four, three, two, one, release. Here you can see some of the resulting damage, most of which was confined to the nose and underside of the aircraft. Describing the program that will follow this series of crash tests, Langley engineer Bob Thompson. Uh, in the future, what we hope to learn is to, to integrate some energy absorption concepts into airframe design technology. This gives the aircraft designer some means of putting together the energy absorption concepts with the airframe. Crash worthiness tests like these may one day lead to the design of lightweight aircraft that can absorb much of the impact energy of a crash and hopefully reduce fatalities. It's called IMBLEMS, short for Integrated Medical and Behavioral Laboratory Measurement System. It was designed to medically monitor the well-being of astronauts on distant space flights. Field testing is scheduled to begin in 1975 in a remote region near Tucson, Arizona. It should also provide information of value to conventional earthbound medical research and practice, especially in remote areas where accessibility to medical services is limited. The system will use computers, modern communications, and advanced medical instrumentation to transmit information on a patient at a remote site to doctors many miles away. This will enable physicians to diagnose conditions and prescribe treatment to trained paramedics on the scene. Emblems, if successful, this design for space technology will improve health care and medical services to many isolated areas on Earth. Presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. National Air.
Aeronautics and Space Administration presents Aeronautics and Space Report. Last month, thousands of people along the east coast of the United States witnessed a total eclipse of the sun by the moon, an event that will not again be visible in North America in this century. At Wallops Island, Virginia, NASA scientists and technicians prepared and launched some 31 sounding rockets, Apache, Cajun, Iroquois, Tomahawk, small rockets ranging in size from 8 to 11 feet. Six Earth-orbiting satellites already in space made measurements from their vantage points. The studies of the solar event were designed to learn more about the effects of the sun on the atmosphere and the region of space near Earth. Although the eclipse was at its peak at 1.38 p.m. on March 7th, the researchers began firing their rocket probes into the sky early in the morning the day before the eclipse and continued the launchings through the following day. This allowed scientists to make comparisons before, during, and after the event. The eclipse provided a unique opportunity to study sudden changes in the sun's radiation, which affects the Earth, changes that usually take place slowly as day turns to night. It will be several months before the mountains of data returned by the sounding rockets can be completely analyzed. These men are preparing to fly an Earth Resources Survey mission. Their target, the island of Jamaica. Recently, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the government of Jamaica asked NASA to record photographic and thermal images of the Jamaican island. NASA is presently using planes to check out sensing equipment that will one day fly on unmanned Earth Resources satellites and the manned orbiting Skylab. For the surveys of Jamaica, flights were made over the island and coastal waters at varying altitudes from 3,000 to 25,000 feet. On board, infrared cameras and sensors recorded photographic and thermal images as they passed over various land and water masses. Every object on land or sea emits visible light, heat, and other radiation which can be measured. From surveys like this, much can be learned about the condition of crops, forests, mineral deposits, and water resources. Some 15 field teams moved about the island to be in position when the aircraft flew over. This correlation from above and below gives scientists what they call ground truth. Although it has an average rainfall of 200 inches yearly, much of the mountain river water never reaches Jamaica's cities. Suspected are submarine springs that carry a portion of the water offshore into the ocean. Mr. John Williams of the Jamaica Geological Survey came to the Manned Spacecraft Center, Houston, to review data resulting from the 10 flights. What we particularly wanted to do was to locate offshore discharge of groundwater. There's a very large uh, submarine discharge of groundwater around the coast in the limestone areas. Uh, but for various reasons, it's difficult to pick up. And we've seen uh, from work in other parts of the world that it can be done by remote sensing. The other objective was to pick up water-bearing structures in the limestone. Some work was done on this uh, from photography taken by the Apollo 9 mission, and that is where we got the idea from. Earth Resources Surveys. During the months ahead, officials from Jamaica and the United Nations will be reviewing results of the 17,000 photographs and complex sensing data. The sounds you hear are those made by a spacecraft component being tested before launch. It's a form of electronic language between machine and space engineer. To make use of every square inch of available space on board satellites, engineers have had to design extremely small, lightweight, highly reliable parts. 
It is here that microelectronics play an important role. This artwork is enlarged 200 times and shows the layout of some 2,000 computer memory elements. Here's what the end product looks like, a tiny, tiny chip weighing less than one-tenth of a gram. These are the 2,000 computer elements seen in the artwork enlargement. Compared to a pin, they look like this. One of the men closely involved in producing micro-miniaturized parts is Mr. John Lyons. He tells how these improved circuits have affected spacecraft flying in the last five years. Up until 1965 or 1966, all of the data that was generated by spacecraft sensors and scientific experiments had to be transmitted back to the ground for processing. The problem that arose from this situation was that we literally began to fill warehouses with magnetic tape reels that housed this data. To circumvent this situation, it was decided that some type of computer or data processor would have to be flown in the spacecraft so that the data could be processed as it was accumulated and only the answers sent back to the ground. Now, in order to design and implement a computer sophisticated enough to accomplish this, a large number of parts had to be housed in a very small area or volume. Microelectronics is the mechanism that made this possible. It allowed us to get as many as 2,000 electronic components into a very small silicon integrated circuit. Microelectronics, small sized devices with a big job to do in the U.S. space program. been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Tornado, a violent rotating current of air sometimes reaching speeds up to 300 miles per hour. Tornadoes occur in the United States at the rate of nearly 800 a year, more than anywhere else in the world. Unlike hurricanes and other types of storms, tornado damage is erratic. Sweeping through a housing development, for instance, one house may be completely destroyed, while the one next door remains untouched. Dr. Theodore Fujita of the University of Chicago is doing research for NASA to find out what causes the devastating funnels, and eventually learn how to spot them from weather satellites. Then what I'm really doing is that uh, uh, try to pinpoint which particular thunderstorm might produce tornado. In fact, uh, only 1% of total thunderstorms will produce some kind of tornado. Therefore, it would be very important and desirable to find out which particular one out of 100 thunderstorms will be producing a tornado. Dr. Fujita and his assistants keep a close eye on weather patterns over the entire United States hoping to catch an early glimpse of tornado-forming clouds as they occur. When a weather front is observed building, they fly within 20 to 100 miles of the clouds and take photographs. These are later analyzed and compared to other cloud pictures in an effort to discover common patterns. To study the nature of thunderstorms and their relationship to tornadoes, Dr. Fujita and his associates have built a machine that simulates the thunderstorm-producing twisters, a tornado machine. Once in motion, a series of overlapping cups turn slowly at the outside but faster in the center, giving the machine its wind force. 
Suction holes at the top of the rotating cuffs pull the air toward the center, simulating the updraft of a rotating thunderstorm. Dry ice bubbles away in large water-filled trays a few feet below the whirling tornado machine. The smoke serves as a tracer, so it's possible to observe the dynamics of a tornado as it whips into a dancing funnel. Dr. Fujita believes that some of the heaviest destruction is caused by suction spots inside the funnel wall. These supercharged spots may be rotating much faster than the main funnel, thus causing the erratic damage, characteristic of a tornado. To help visualize a twister's motion, observe the explosive force caused by the tornado machine as its influence is brought to bear on some small pieces of lightweight material. This violent action is similar to what takes place in a real tornado. NASA would like to one day be able to spot tornado-producing clouds from an Earth-orbiting satellite far enough in advance to give at least a two-hour warning. Once this becomes a reality, scientists can then concentrate on dissipating or defusing the destructive power of tornadoes. a long way in weather forecasting since the early balloon launching days, thanks mainly to weather satellites. Just 15 years ago this month, NASA launched the first Tyros weather satellite from Cape Canaveral. The views of Earth were pretty rudimentary compared to today's high quality pictures, but they proved that routine global weather observation by satellite was possible. With each succeeding one, these weather sentinels have become more and more sophisticated. Here, the synchronous meteorological satellite. Two are already in orbit, with a third scheduled for launch this fall. Besides transmitting cloud cover pictures every 30 minutes, day and night, SMS can receive and send environmental information from thousands of manned and unmanned data collection platforms located at sea, in rivers, lakes, and on land. The synchronous meteorological satellite pictures are made into film loops daily at the World Weather Center near Washington, D.C. to show cloud movement over oceans and land masses. Meteorologists are hopeful that this kind of information will give them clues to the weather conditions that, for instance, cause tornadoes and other fast-moving weather systems. Weather satellites, over the past 15 years, they have returned more than two million pictures provided advance warnings, and allowed no major storm anywhere on the globe to go undetected. and is recorded like this, and its results can be shattering. Earthquake, many times devastating, still unpredictable. But there are serious efforts underway right now to help better understand the dynamics of earthquakes and to one day be able to predict their occurrence in advance. One of these efforts is being carried out by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. It's called Project Ares, 
short for Astronomical Radio Interferometric Earth Surveying. What you're seeing here is the move of the transportable Aries antenna from Palos Verdes, California to Saddle Peak overlooking Santa Monica Bay, but more importantly, sitting right on the Santa Monica Malibu Fault. What NASA scientists are doing is looking at subtle changes in the ground which are thought to precede earthquakes. To do this, they are using distant objects known as quasars as a frame of reference. Quasars are objects that are perhaps at the edge of the universe and they emit random radio signals. Those random signals arrive at the Earth and are received at a station, Ares, this transportable 30-foot antenna, as well as fixed antennas in the Mojave Desert at Goldstone and at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. We record the signals then onto digital magnetic tapes, take the tapes after the fact to a special purpose device which matches up the random patterns and then determines the difference of time of arrival. We can determine those differences to within one-tenth of a billionth of a second and in this way measure with an accuracy now of a few inches, the three-dimensional relationship between these antennas, which are separated by many hundreds of miles. And from that, we can begin to resolve some fundamental controversies with regard to the size and shape of the Earth, as well as looking for very subtle deformations that are going on in the Earth's crust that may indeed be warnings of future earthquakes. Before the Ares technique can be broadly accepted by earthquake prediction researchers, its accuracy must be verified. This is being done with the help of the Commerce Department's National Geodetic Survey, who believe the new system could vastly improve traditional land surveying as well. The Department of Commerce is interested in this type of technology because it could revolutionize the science of land surveying. Not only is it more accurate over longer distances, but indeed it may even be quite a bit cheaper to do it with this type of technology. This is just a tiny section of the San Andreas Fault that runs through California. Small shifts in the land, either up or down, are measurable and constantly occurring. Thus, by making a measurement here initially at this site, at this time, and then revisiting this location a year from now or two years from now, we will be able to discern those subtle changes in the Earth's crust, which may be indicative of strains accumulating to be relieved later as an earthquake. While there are still many unknowns, NASA's Project Ares is an attempt to accurately measure slight shifts in the land, a technique that may one day play a key role in predicting earthquakes. Views of Earth as seen from space have affected how we view ourselves on a not-so-large planet. We have become painfully aware that such things as air, water, and other natural resources are not limitless. Helping survey them now are two landsats like this, spacecraft that look constantly back at Earth, part of a continuing effort by NASA to make the monitoring of Earth and its resources a routine operation. The one-ton, 10-foot-tall Landsat 3 was recently launched from the Western Test Range in Southern California. Equipped with advanced television cameras, Landsat can define areas as small as a half acre and waterways as narrow as 65 feet. From its vantage point above Earth, Landsat can transmit 500 pictures a day to ground stations all over the world. Two leg, go for command. Pictures that give information about surface waters, snow, glaciers, oil, crops, forests, marine life, and population distribution, a service paid for by user countries. Landsat 3 is able to take pictures day and night, and with infrared photography, can measure the temperature of plant life, making it possible to determine the health of crops. Landsats, spacecraft with a down-to-earth monitoring job to do. Since the beginning, man has been intrigued by the stars. Stars spend most of their lives quietly burning away their nuclear fuels as if they were giant reactors. 
They are much more efficient at producing energy than is our primitive burning of fuels on Earth today. The sun is a small star, yet one second of its output is equal to all the energy ever consumed on Earth. Great potential benefits may come from studying and understanding the stars, how they produce energy, and then how they transmit it over millions of miles of empty space, losing little, if any, of its intensity along the way. All astronomy was done by human eyes and telescopes before space exploration with men and satellites allowed scientists to lift their instruments above the Earth's distorting atmosphere. High energy streaming out from the stars is hidden by this atmosphere. This is HEO, short for High Energy Astronomy Observatory. It is the first of three such star watchers being readied by TRW for launch between now and 1979. Weighing nearly three tons, HEO is made up of two parts, an experiments module and a spacecraft module. Once in space, this first high-energy astronomy observatory will rotate slowly so that over a six-month period of time, it will scan the entire cosmos, mapping everything it observes, pulsars, quasars, supernova, and black holes. HEO, a new space observatory to help us understand how extremely high energies are generated in space, perhaps unlocking secrets of the evolution of the universe, even showing new ways to generate power here on Earth. From a distance, it looks like any other plane coming in for a landing. The similarities end there, however. Inside, this Convair 990 jet is filled with highly sophisticated science experiments, a laboratory with wings. Called Galileo 2, the Airborne Science Laboratory flies its missions from NASA's Ames Research Center in California. It is seen here recently landing in Melbourne, Australia, one stop in a globe-spanning experiment from pole to pole to see if there are changes in our upper atmosphere caused by gases used in aerosol cans and from other pollutants. Now we're looking for a variety of components of the atmosphere. Some of them are natural and some of them are man-made. We're looking for ozone, water vapor, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide. Those are mostly naturally made. Now we're also looking for some man-made contaminants. There are eight different experiments either in or on the plane. Some collect samples from probes mounted outside the aircraft. With the onboard computer, many are analyzed on the spot. Others are bottled and returned to the laboratory for additional analysis. Scientists are collecting information on everything they can detect in our atmosphere. From the Earth up, aerosols, jet plane exhaust, anything that might adversely affect our planet. From space, they measure cosmic rays and charged particles. Even measurements of water vapor are proving to be helpful and may be the key to avoiding air turbulence. All the data taken is now being studied by universities and research centers, both here and abroad. Surveying atmospheric pollution from an airborne laboratory, a cooperative effort to study the effects of pollution on the overall atmosphere and on life here. It's reliable, will probably last billions of years, and if you collect its energy from above the Earth's atmosphere in space, it can be done continuously. The sun, a gigantic nuclear furnace that affects everything on our planet from weather to radio signals. At the Goldstone Station in California, a tracking dish is being used to simulate an energy satellite in space. It sends an invisible beam of microwave energy to this rectenna, which represents a ground receiving station. The microwave is converted to electricity and powers the lights you see here. This is a small scale demonstration of how a solar satellite would send its power back to Earth. By building huge solar satellites in space, NASA believes some of the sun's tremendous energy can be captured to lessen our dependence on more conventional fossil fuels. We feel that it not only uh, has uh, feasibility both economically and technically, but that it also fits the other programs which uh, NASA is going to be doing 
in the in the 80s with the space shuttle because we need large structures we need large amounts of power in space by itself to carry out the things that we see are going to make space productive in helping to produce products for use on the earth as well as to help solving some of the, the problems we have on earth for sheer size a solar satellite would be unprecedented a structure 35 to 40 square miles covered with solar cells, able to capture the sun's energy 24 hours a day and beam it to Earth. One solar satellite would probably weigh from 100 to 150 million pounds, as much as two World War II battleships. There are many ways to construct this thing, uh, probably by uh, doing it, carrying the raw materials up and actually building the beams that would support it in space. Uh, these, these devices are, are generally available even here on the Earth today. They're varying kinds of machines that just take flat stock of material and roll them up and then weld them uh, into varying kinds of shapes such as uh, Susan Roebuck today uh, makes aluminum or steel gutters. Uh, the thing that you have to remember that's different about building structure in space as a, compared to the Earth is it doesn't have to support its own weight. So it's, it's much lighter to begin with. You have to, don't have to worry about uh, 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 these large masses supporting themselves, so it can be stiff without being heavy. Solar satellites will cost billions of dollars, but over a 30-year operating life, they should be able to pay for themselves. The country's projected energy needs in the early part of the next century will be two and a half times what they are today. Dr. Kraft feels we could be producing 20 to 30 percent of our total energy by that time using solar satellites, with each satellite generating 10,000 megawatts. Fifty of these stations would provide all of the power that is being produced in the United States today. So one of these stations would be equivalent to producing all of the electrical energy for both industrial and home purposes, domestic purposes, in a city and urban area the size of Washington, D.C., or, or Houston, or uh, San Francisco, or Chicago, uh, etc. So one of these stations is a very, very powerful electrical energy producer. Space solar power, perhaps the most efficient way to collect energy from the sun in the years ahead. visitors from outer space come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. They are meteorites, some four and a half billion years old. And they are being found in relatively large numbers in Antarctica. 1,300 have been collected during the last few years. The total number of meteorites in collections around the world was only 2,000 before the Antarctica finds. So the discoveries there have come as a tremendous surprise to scientists interested in doing research on these cosmic travelers. Because of the movement of Antarctica's blue ice being pushed away in a conveyor belt sort of action, meteorites are brought to the surface in certain places when pressure pushes the ice up and the ice then evaporates, leaving the dark colored meteorites standing out against the snow or lighter rocks. The meteorites are really small fragments from an asteroid belt that might have helped form a planet. Many of them are drawn into the orbits of Jupiter, Mars, or even the Earth. So here in Antarctica, preserved by its icy conditions, is some of the oldest material of the solar system, some of the very material that went to make up Earth, for example.
By studying meteorites, scientists hope to find answers to two very fundamental questions. Is there life beyond Earth? And what are the processes that led to life on Earth? NASA and the National Science Foundation have been working together to preserve the meteorites for careful analysis. At the Johnson Space Center's Lunar Receiving Laboratory, the meteorites are prepared for distribution to scientists all over the world. They are handled similar to the way samples returned from the moon by the astronauts are handled. One of the people analyzing the meteorites is Dr. Cyril Panamperuma, director of the University of Maryland's Laboratory of Chemical Evolution. See, what we are trying to find out in the meteorites is to see whether there are any of these molecules related to life. There are certain molecules like the amino acids, which may be described as the building blocks of life. The meteorites present to us the only prebiotic matter we have laid hands on. So we like to find out whether in this meteorite, in this sample, are any amino acids, any hydrocarbons. So the process is one of extracting the meteorite, taking the molecules that are in there, dissolving them in a solvent that will get them out. Then we have a small amount of liquid that will contain some of these molecules. At that point, we will go to a gas chromatograph, an instrument that will separate this component. We will inject a very tiny sample into a gas chromatograph and see whether these individual components can be picked up by a detector. Dr. Panamperoma has found organic compounds in the meteorites, organic compounds which are necessary for all life, and they are different from any found in living organisms on Earth. What does that imply is that all those events that led to life may be common in the universe. So what we said happened on the Earth may be happening somewhere else. Administration presents Aeronautics and Space Report. A giant balloon system, 60 stories high, carrying a three and a half ton optical telescope as scientific cargo. Stratoscope 2, a cooperative project between NASA, the National Science Foundation, and Princeton University was recently assigned the mission of photographing the distant planets Jupiter and Uranus from a 15 miles high vantage point, well above most of the Earth's distorting atmosphere. Additional targets for the huge telescope included a clear view of far off galaxies and clouds of interstellar gas and dust, an attempt to help scientists learn more about the birth and death of stars. Liftoff occurred just before sunset on March 26 from Palestine, Texas. Controlled from the ground by radio and TV systems, Stratoscope attained its planned 80,000 foot altitude and remained there overnight, conducting telescopic observations into deep space. Its mission completed, the balloon system was commanded back to Earth the following day, landing six miles northeast of Corinth, Mississippi. With the high altitude data successfully recovered, scientists are busy analyzing the results. 
Among many photographs under study, the remote planet Uranus, over a billion and a half miles away. Also photographed, Jupiter, largest of the nine planets, ten times the size of Earth. Sample results from Stratoscope 2, a balloon-borne scientific examination of deep space and distant planets. Weightlessness, zero gravity, only a probability a few years ago, now a reality for men and machines flying in space for days, even weeks at a time. Testing rocket and spacecraft components under zero gravity before they're actually flown in space has always been a problem. Short periods of weightlessness can be created inside aircraft flying a roller coaster path through the sky. As it arches over the top of its trajectory, experiments inside the plane can attain zero G for a few seconds. At NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio, another and more highly controlled method of achieving weightlessness is employed on a daily basis, underground. Two, one, release. It's called the Zero Gravity Research Facility and consists of an underground shaft extending 50 stories straight down. Experiment packages are dropped the full length of the shaft under space-like vacuum conditions and experience five seconds of weightlessness during their free fall. Ten seconds of zero G can be attained by catapulting the experiment up from the bottom of the shaft and allowing it to fall back down again. One of the things engineers at Lewis are concerned with is the behavior of fluids, rocket fuel in particular in the absence of gravity. Understanding and control of liquid fuel in space is vital to the success of many missions, like Apollo, where engines must be started, stopped, and restarted under zero G. During their five or ten seconds of free fall, experiment packages at Lewis are photographed by high-speed cameras and monitored electronically from a central control room. Zero gravity research testing systems and components for application to weightless space missions. A shuttle to carry men and equipment to orbiting space stations is one of NASA's goals for this decade. When launched into space, the big shuttle craft could carry 12 passengers and 25,000 pounds of cargo. The space shuttle will be unique because it can fly a space mission, return through the searing heat of the Earth's atmosphere, and then land almost anywhere like an airplane. Recently, a one-tenth scale model of the proposed shuttlecraft was prepared for a series of drop tests. The shuttle test vehicle is 13 feet long, has an eight-foot wingspan, and weighs 600 pounds. It is made mostly of fiberglass, including breakaway fiberglass wingtips. These parts can be easily changed to update the model or replaced if any of the parts are damaged. The model was carried to an altitude of nearly 12,000 feet by a heavy-duty helicopter. The drop tests are being made to see how the test shuttlecraft makes transitions from a high-angle re-entry to a level cruise attitude. It will also test the stalling characteristics of the vehicle and give engineers data on the craft's performance while in free flight. There's the drop. On board the test craft are telemetry and command systems, radar, stabilizing and recovery parachutes, and a forward-looking onboard movie camera. All control commands to the model are made from a ground control van near the drop zone. Because it lands nose down, the model uses a crushable nose section to absorb the landing shock. Shuttlecraft drop tests, paving the way for future spaceships that will carry passengers and cargo to orbiting space stations and then return to Earth like an airplane. As jet planes are designed larger and fly faster, an important part of that design will be to assure safe control by their pilots. 
At NASA's Ames Research Center near San Francisco, engineers test aircraft takeoff, landing, and piloting problems on the ground. The work is done with simulators. One of the largest and most sophisticated is the flight simulator for advanced aircraft. This simulator is uh, the latest in a uh, long line of uh, developing motion simulators to present the problem to the pilot of controlling a very large vehicle in landing and uh, takeoff phases of flight. The thing that makes it different from any other simulator is the extent of the motion, particularly the lateral travel. It has 100 feet of lateral travel, which the pilots have maintained is necessary in order for them to evaluate certain key problems in handling this class of aircraft. Uh, for example, when the pilot wants to experience an engine failure after takeoff, the airplane translates considerably from the center line of the runway in its response to this, and the pilot wants the real motion so that he gets all of his real cues in attempting to cope with the problem. All the sights and sounds, even the periodic bumps of tar strips on runways can be duplicated. Flight simulators, on the ground aeronautical investigations of future jet transports. What you are seeing are vortices, tornado-like patterns of air generated by planes, made visible here by colored smoke as the plane flies by. They present a problem to other aircraft, especially during takeoff and landing. Weak turbulence has been recognized as a hazard for many years. The problem has become more critical recently as larger and more powerful jet planes take to the air. The danger of the swirling air masses is multiplied because they occur unexpectedly and the pilot of an airplane cannot see them. This animation shows the cylindrical masses of air as they whip around the wingtips of a plane causing vortex. These Federal Aviation Agency wind tunnel tests further illustrate the way a vortex forms. How violent the turbulence will be depends on the plane's weight and speed. The air turbulence caused by vortices has been observed lingering on for several minutes after a plane passes by. NASA is approaching the problem first by trying to better understand the vortex phenomenon. At the Flight Research Center in California, a plane trails a larger aircraft to experience and study vortices in flight. Other engineers are looking at various wing designs and modifications in an attempt to break up the vortices before they occur. Marshall Space Flight Center researchers in Huntsville, Alabama are trying to adapt laser technology to remotely monitor the invisible vortices in terminal areas. The laser provides a radar-like system that sweeps the sky and can see where the whirlwinds of air are located. The vortex churned up by this airplane as it flies by a smoke tower is spotted by laser and becomes a readable pattern that engineers can measure and record. The results of these various research programs are expected to provide a better understanding of vortices and make airport operations safer and more effective. <laughs> Galaxies. Before the year 1900, few people knew what they were. We now know that galaxies are the largest single accumulation of stars in the universe. Each galaxy is a stellar system, separate and apart from all others. Many people study these unique star clusters through powerful telescopes. At NASA's Langley Research Center in Virginia, Dr. Frank Hole uses computers to learn how galaxies evolve. Any number of stars from 50,000 to a million can be programmed into computers in disk-like circular structures. Computer cards are made and fed into a punch card machine. The readout is then transferred to tape and printed on paper showing a still picture-like image of the galaxy being simulated. At the same time, another machine prints out the star patterns in numerical form. It is also displayed visually and recorded on film. 
Here are scenes showing how the simulated galaxies finally look on film. With all these various types of information in hand, scientists can then determine how a specific galaxy forms, learning more about the universe, and maybe eventually catching glimpses of the early stages of time. These sounds of our jet age are familiar ones. To people living near airports where the big jets take off and land, the noise levels range from annoying to nearly intolerable. NASA has been working on the problem of reducing jet aircraft noise for several years. Solutions, while not easy, are inevitable. Quiet jet engine research is being conducted jointly by government industry teams. For example, the Boeing company under contract to NASA is looking at two separate ways to reduce noise levels. Since the high frequency whine generated by a jet engine is the most irritating, studies have been concentrated in this area. A standard production engine being used today looks like this. Here are engines treated with 338 square feet of sound absorbing lining. Before flight testing the acoustically treated engines, 20 microphones were strategically placed along a runway. Vans housed the recording and test equipment. Because it was important to measure the exact distances between the microphones and the plane, radar tracked and precisely located the plane's position. In addition to the scientific measurements, these people gave their subjective reactions to the noise. All the tests were carried out under predefined weather conditions, and a meteorological station located in the center of the acoustic range made continuous weather measurements. Data was also taken over water, where atmospheric conditions were more stable. For the level flyby acoustic tests, the airplane was flown at 400 feet altitude at 160 knots. Sound is measured in decibels of perceived noise. Using the acoustically treated engines, the perceived noise was reduced by over 95%. Listen to the difference as first the plane with the untreated engines flies over. Now the acoustically treated plane. As expected, this noise reduction was not made without some penalties. For instance, there is an increase in total operating cost and a reduction in distance a plane can travel without being refueled. Efforts to reduce these and other penalties are continuing through additional research and development. Another engine noise modification program carried out by Boeing for NASA was the Sonic Throat Inlet Study. This diaphragm-like device built into a jet engine regulates the flow of air. For approach and landing, the minimum flow position. When noise suppression is not needed, such as at cruising altitudes, the maximum flow is used. Now let's see how effective it is. While these studies are going on to improve existing engines, the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland is trying to build a completely new engine, an engine designed to be quiet. Right now, they are testing various parts of jet engines to see which ones cause noise. Once they know this, a quieter engine can be built. Quieter jet engines, new designs tested in the next two years will make jet aircraft of the future much more tolerable. These men are getting ready to practice landing and taking off from the moon. Although they never leave the ground, the simulation is as close to the real thing as technology can provide. One of the most important parts of this lunar landing simulator at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston is the detailed relief sections of the moon's surface, complete with craters. It is painstakingly put together by U.S. Army topographers in Washington, D.C. When completed, the lunar surface model is three-dimensional. 
Working from pictures like these taken from unmanned lunar orbiters, and using this special machine that can measure to within a millionth of an inch, a technician identifies various known points on the lunar photo for position fixing. As the operator zeroes in on a specific spot, coordinates are fed into a computer, tying together an entire area of the moon's surface. With this information, both the longitude and latitude can be determined. Next, a stereo image is transferred to an analytical plotter, which in turn draws in craters and contours. It can draw and measure with great accuracy even small craters a few feet in size. These photo enlargements are blow-ups made from the plotter. The men here are marking the position of the craters onto a clear plastic overlay. This forms the blueprint for the lunar surface background to be used on the simulator. Next, the two foot by two foot clear square overlays are lifted off the floor and given to compilers who outline the very small craters. This is the final step before the lunar blueprint goes to the model shop. In the model shop, lunar surface contours are traced and a router cuts craters and contours into plastic foam blocks. Using the original lunar orbiter photographs as guides, the model is shaped and small craters carved. Then, paint is sprayed on to highlight the contours. Finally, the blocks are laid out on the floor where very small craters are punched out with a hand machine. After being shipped to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, the model is formed into a lightweight epoxy, resin, and fiberglass section and is painted. When the relief model, which closely duplicates an Apollo landing site, is installed on the lunar landing simulator, the crew practices landing and taking off from the moon. Mountains, craters, and valleys show up before them in exact scale and position. The end result? Precision Moon Landings by Project Apollo Astronauts. Lunar Map Making, a vital job performed by those on the ground for the men who land on the moon. This has been an Aeronautics and Space Report presented by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Here at the 19th.